Good morning. My name is Reggie Gibson, and you are welcome to worship with us here today at First Parish Lexington, where we are a Unitarian Universalist congregation who believe in the beauty and the sanctity of all life. I will be leading the worship service today, but first we'll be starting with some centering music. And the music you will hear is titled Pure Imagination. It was composed by Leslie Briskus and Anthony Newley, and you probably will know it from the film The Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Singing that for us will be Mr. David Meharry. sounded wonderful. Well, welcome again to First Parish in Lexington. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we have so many announcements that it, the best way to find out all about the wonderful programming we have here at First Parish is to look at your Wednesday Steeple Chronicle email. That's a, a little online newsletter, and if you don't get it, I strongly advise that you contact our church office and get it. Um, this week, we have a, a program on Tuesday. Uh, our church services are going to start up again uh, uh, next week on uh, Sunday. Uh, we have a number of ways you can engage in our social justice programs that are also starting up, so I really want to uh, highlight that, in including some ways to engage with the UUA wider denomination. I also want to remind you that our joys and concerns should probably put, be put in chat before we get to the sermon, because we do read that afterwards, and you need to put it in ahead of time for us to be able to read it. 
During social hour this afternoon, or this after the service, we're going to have normal breakout rooms for small group socializing. Um, but in addition, there is going to be a newcomer meet and greet room, specifically for newcomers who have been joining us virtually during this pandemic or have signed up online to meet us. If you are a newcomer and have not signed up ahead of time, you can send a private chat to Pete Tasker, who's currently on Zoom, indicating your interest to be invited to the meet and greet room during social hour. And there'll be some instructions after the service how to get into that breakup room. Our chalice lighting this morning is written by our worship leader this morning, Reggie O'Hare Gibson. We light this flame for every human being that lives, has ever lived, or will live. May we discover how each of us is a character in this collective narrative being written, that we each have an important role to play in this epic poem of human becoming. And now, will you please join me in reciting our unison affirmation of faith. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another, that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Our introit this morning is Sicut Servus, written by Giovanni Palestrina. It is sung by our singers uh, in Sanctuary, Natalie Briere, Jennifer Burks, Julia Jaffe, Dave Meharry, Jamie Willis, and accompanied by our own Rip Jackson.
Once again, good morning to all. It is good to be in both digital and organic community. I want to thank Reverend Ann for opening up the pulpit and taking a chance on me. And I also want to thank the folks who have made this Sunday and all Fellowship Sundays a reality. This is always a team making things occur. And very often, we don't see the bees that bring us the sweetest honey. Even more so in a time of sickness and pestilence, we need community. So we gather and have continued to gather, both physically and electronically, all of us summoned here into a space that will be always what we make it together. So together, let's make it sacred community. Will you please sing with us, as you are willing and able, hymn 1028, The Fire of Commitment. a moment of mission as we do for every one of our services. Today we are going to be hearing from the climate action team and we're going to, a uh, member of that team, Debbie Fortin, will have a message for all of us on Zoom. And also Bob Qual, but I think it's Debbie Fortin. <laughs> Changing Our Ways, Poetic Form by Martin Niemöller. 160 mile per hour super typhoon hit the Philippines, destroying the drinking water. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in the Philippines. A deadly downpour hit Hunan, China, dropping one year's rain in three days. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Hunan. Unprecedented fires hit Australia, burning 21% of forests. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Australia. Devastating landslides hit India, 
forcing 12 million people from their homes. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in India. Silent killer heat wave hit Greece, igniting vast conflagrations. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Greece. Double cyclones hit Southern Africa, killing 1,000 people. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Africa. Prolonged drought hit Guatemala, causing pervasive malnutrition. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Guatemala. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, killing 3,000 people. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Puerto Rico. An inconceivable heat dome hit British Columbia, causing nearly 500 deaths. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't really live in British Columbia. Historic wildfires hit California, destroying 10 million acres. But we still didn't change our ways because we didn't really live in California. All live in California. A killer tornado hit Kentucky, killing 100 people. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't live in Kentucky. A terrifying deluge hit New York City, drowning people in the subway. But we didn't change our ways because we didn't all live in New York City. Does it have to happen right here for us to change our ways, or will that be too late? Well, thank you, Debbie. That was wonderful. I would like to remind everyone at this moment in the service that our programs here at First Parish can't be accomplished without the generosity of all those people who attend our church services and our programming. We are so blessed that even during this time of the pandemic that we have been able to accommodate and switch, and that is not without some need for purchases and for staffing, et cetera. So I hope as we go into the next uh, budget season and, uh, and stewardship campaign, we remember also on this day that your generosity is so appreciated for everything that we do here at First Parish. So now we are gonna be taking the offertory. Please aim your camera at the QR code on your screen and please be as generous as you feel able. Our offertory is by the Judds. It's called When I Reach the Place I'm Going, and it is sung by Natalie Briere, Rip Jackson, and Jamie Willis. When I reach the place I'm going, I will show. Ah! 
Thank you, Natalie, Rip, and Jamie. This reading this morning comes to us from Robert William Service. This is an edited paraphrasing of a verse poem of his called Character. Robert Service was a British Canadian poet and journalist during the latter part of the 19th and into the mid 20th centuries. And he says, how often do I wish I were what people would call a good character. I'd radiate hope and cheer and grow kindlier with each ear. I'd neither argument nor anger know, but my own way would serenely go. I'd seek to understand the woes of man, yet walk with humor, hand in hand. I'd be simple, decent, kind, be of gentle heart, of quiet mind, letting thought for others be my guide. Let my patience triumph over my pride. I'd show charity for those who err, live life in a way that would make others say he was a blessing, a person of good character. A question of character. Some of you out there know me as, if you say what kind of character I was, you might say he's a poet. He's a writer and performer. That would not be inaccurate. Most of the writing I've done would be classified as poetry, but occasionally I write stories. My feeble forays into fiction often begin with a character who wants something. I envision this character and begin nailing down their basic qualities. I often put those stories away, never to be worked on again, but lately I have been revisiting some of them and have found some surprising analogies between the process of rewriting characters and the process of myself becoming the character I'd like to be. The first thing I do with the character I am revising is to reconcile myself to the idea that everything about this character is in question that everything needs to be reassessed and many aspects may need to change, even the ones I hold dear. I make a list of my character's strengths and liabilities and resolve to work on them. And when I have the strength, so also with myself. I have been assessing what I take as my strengths and my liabilities and asking, what are the aspects of me as a character that serve? And what are those that sever? What qualities will serve this character in changing to a better, stronger, more focused, more compassionate self that is better able to achieve moral objectives concerning family and community? And what qualities I possess that will sever those possibilities? It takes me several attempts to do this. Why? because it's embarrassing. It's painful when I am confronted with the mistakes I have made and the inconsistencies between this character's thoughts and this character's actions. But I must be ready to commit myself to the necessary work of committing myself to the necessary work, to do two overlapping processes, that of revision and editing. A character revision is to re-see a character, to 
re-see, to revision, to look again with a new vision. And to properly revise, I find that I need to define and assess the character's desired goal. Is it a good one? Is the objective a moral one? To what degree is it driven by selfishness, by selflessness? Why is this important to the character? What keeps this character from achieving it? Do the actions of the character help or hinder the character in attaining the goal? Again, which aspects will serve and which will sever? This character says he wants to go to Paris, but if he doesn't want to get off of his couch in Cambridge, Paris is unlikely. What about him keeps him on the couch? What will get him off the couch? Clearly, a mere desire to go to Paris is not enough. Likewise, I ask this Reggie character, if you say, bruh, you want to live in a world that is where people listen more compassionately to one another, but you don't examine how you have not and do not listen compassionately to others, then, Reggie character, you are partly the reason for this present lack of compassion in the world, and you don't deserve to live in that world that you say you want. Why? Because you only deserve to live in a world you actively help create. Let me say that again in case somebody was thumbing through something. You only deserve to live in a world that you actively help create. Therefore, for myself, the need for a Reggie revision, the need to look again at how I am written, look at what script I have been following, and decide what needs to be revised to make this character's stated desires occur. After that painful ass uh, assessment, I must commit to a character edit. A character edit is the process of shaping a character into the quality of person better able to achieve the objective. This involves correcting, condensing, and modifying a character so they will eventually and intentionally commit actions related to the character's goals. And this will come with more tough questioning. Character correcting. What aspects of my character need correcting? In the Reggie character case, too much talking and too little listening. When did he become that way? It's always been there, but became a bit more egregious after becoming a parent. What harm is caused by this flaw? Does not facilitate the desired relationship with those close to him. Where did he learn that? A lot of it is his own, but he probably learned it from imitating the, most, the worst aspects of his parents. Very often, writers give the characters something idiosyncratic or peculiar to them. Often, this peculiarity presents itself when the character is about to do something or get involved in a situation of potential tension. In other words, they're doing that thing again. In the case of the Reggie character, when he should be listening more compassionately, his mind is racing ahead of a conversation in search of ways to counter how he thinks the statement being uttered will conclude. How can you tell this? His mouth is open before the other person stops talking. He rubs the back of his neck, brings his chin toward his chest while keeping his eyes on the person speaking. Knowing this is what happens just before I am about to transform into a jerk helps me to realize that I'm about to do that thing again. That thing I do that severs community and doesn't serve my stated moral objective, to live in a world in which people listen more compassionately to one another. When I noticed this happening, I changed my stance, softened my facial expression and disposition. By doing this, I changed the dynamic of the situation and better interactions between myself and others my children become possible. Character condensing. Often in rewriting characters, you and the character begin to lose focus. For the writer, this occurs when a writer abandons what is necessary and essential for what is extraneous and unnecessary, and potentially disruptive to the necessary and the essential. 
And applying this to the Reggie character, I might ask, what are the distractions that keep him from focusing? Is it that when the questioning and self-examination get a little tough, he turns on Netflix and watches something mindless? Or perhaps something educational so as to convince himself that he is not running from himself, but is moving toward knowledge? <laughs> or does he call a friend to chew the fat and perhaps talk of something else, maybe gossip? Does he reach for an adult juice box to take his mind off this uncomfortable and annoyingly revel revelatory self-gazing? The answer is yes. <laughs> the Reggie character does all of that. Authors note, what would happen if he gave this uncomfortable self-gazing another 15 minutes of sustained attention instead of seeking a release valve the moment he gets freaked out with what he finds? Perhaps he will gain the strength and focus necessary to attain his moral objective? Character modifying. Let's talk a bit about this. By this, I mean examining the character's strengths and liabilities and understanding what slight changes might be made to move the character closer to the intended goal. To illustrate this, I'll depart from literature for just a moment and refer to a film, Major League. Talk about characters. This film about a baseball team on a losing streak features a pitcher named Rick Vaughn who can throw a fastball at up to 101 miles per hour. However, Rick has no control. He practices and practices, but he gets no better. However, he doesn't give up. Later, it's discovered that Rick has horrible eyesight. So, with corrected vision, he can better see what it is he's aiming for. Things begin to improve. Then with patient coaching, Rick begins to recognize what in his form is working and what isn't working as well as it could. He makes slight modifications which, when practiced, improve Rick's pitching dramatically. Rick had the goods. He just needed certain modifications and patience to make him more effective. To modify is not to completely change the character. It is often to take what is a strength or liability and make small adjustments over time to help the character better obtain the goal. I have taken to writing down these interactions I have with those I love in which there has been tension and seeing what little thing or things I did that either made the situation better or worse. What did I do in this situation that served? What did I do that severed? Here's a brief example. We sat by the backyard fire, you and I, as we often do in the summer. The night was clear and the crickets cricketed. We'd argued a week before and swore we didn't want that father and son to be who we would become. You told me how you felt a little depressed, how you never envisioned going to college in your bedroom. You lamented missing your friends and the freedom you no longer have at home with me. You stressed how you needed that freedom and how you'd like to feel the confidence it gave you in that brief time you had outside of my all-seeing eye and unrealistic expectations that you actually get out of bed at 10 a.m. and have to ask to borrow my car. I felt my father's voice rising like the flood in my throat about to spill out. So, if I understand this correctly, what you are telling me is you want to do whatever it is you want to do and have no responsibilities and have me pay for it. Son, one of us is insane. <laughs> but, I held my tongue, put my hand over my mouth, and instead, listened to the tears you barely held back. Writing these vignettes helps me better understand the Reggie character, how he reacts and interacts with those he loves and desires to be in community with. Revision. Take another look at what you think you know and be committed to seeing things differently. Editing. Be prepared to reshape everything. Correcting. 
Assess what needs to be corrected, condensing, focus, and don't reach for anything extraneous that takes focus away, modifying, ask what other small changes need to be made to better attain the goal. We all, as characters, have traits that, if practiced with intention, can be improved and make us better able to achieve our moral objectives. But improvement is unlikely without us getting off our comfy couches and challenging and questioning. And at this time in history, we need to question and challenge much. Question and challenge who we are as moral beings. Question and challenge all received narratives. Question and challenge what we've accepted about ourselves and about others. Question and challenge ourselves about what characteristics we need to change that don't serve us well and only sever us from our better selves and from being better to each other. I wonder how this time of pandemic is going to change our character. In what new ways will we see our strengths and liabilities? What will we revise, edit, correct, condense, modify? I suspect that three years ago, had you been asked what essential and valuable work is, you may have given slightly different answers than you might now. Likewise, I found, found myself revising my idea of what it means to be vulnerable. Because I live in Lexington, an affluent town, I never asked who are the most vulnerable people in my neighborhood. I have been much more concerned with thoughts of characters who look like me and live in less affluent parts of our commonwealth and wondering what are we doing to help them the ones that our society often overlooks and undervalues. So I never really thought of those characters in Lexington who might be vulnerable. During my reassessment, I asked myself, why? And truthfully, I did not like many of the answers I gave myself. Ultimately, I, I think I hadn't thought of doing so because I am surrounded by so many who see themselves as valuable that I never think of any of them as being potentially vulnerable. Then I was made aware of the elders in the assisted living facility, the ones near me, and how desperately they were in need of company for family they couldn't see anymore, how they had had so many people who were dying on them they needed to make new connections. Then I was painfully made aware of how many people were locked in with abusive partners and of those with disabilities, both seen and unseen, who could not get the therapy they needed to just make life a bit more bearable. I began to think of the eccentric man I would see alone at St. Bridget's Church, the man who I always avoided even before the pandemic. I now find myself wondering if he's okay. And why was he always at that church? What did he need? What kind word could I have given? And now I ask myself, why was I so dismissive and avoidant of him? Is this the character I want to be? Is this the change I want to promote? Is this the world I wish to work toward? No, it isn't. So I have taken to working more diligently at asking who nearest me in proximity is most at risk and why? How can I help? How can I get rid of my preconceived notions about who I believe they are and do what a good citizen must do? What does it mean to be a good citizen? What do I owe to my fellow citizen? What essential and valuable work will I do to help advance sacred community? These questions help pull me and may help you be pulled back to your stated moral objectives. They are questions in which we must grapple with in our current context. And I submit that if we do, with intention, with honesty and a resolve to better the answers, we might notice how our characters begin to change how they begin to become more complex, more self-aware of their power to transform the dynamic of a situation. This pandemic is changing us. 
in ways which are subtle and gross, perceptible and imperceptible. Human beings have never gone through this kind of tribulation and remained unchanged. No matter how imperceptibly so, we have been changed, and we as characters have been changed. And we see now that we are in a narrative. We are all living. And this new narrative moving forward will also change us. The question is, changed into what? Will we be the jaded character who has learned to become more cynical, the wide-eyed naive, too cowardly to act, assess, or challenge, the headstrong non-listener, convinced they know it all? Or will we change into the one that listens with compassion, the one unafraid to reassess strengths and liabilities and question themselves honestly, challenge themselves to be better, and actively work to bring action into accord with the highest good. Who do we want to be when we come to the other side of this? Well, that will depend on whether we see this time strictly as an inconvenience in which we are marking days until it's over, or as a time of cocooning in which we learn to transform, to change our caterpillar selves into butterfly. Perhaps what new narrative each of, us, us, each of us will write and ultimately live will be a question of character. Won't you please join us in singing our anthem, Can You Imagine, by Alan Kepke. <coughs> Sang by Natalie Briere, Jennifer Burke, Julia Jaffe, David Meharry, and Jamie Wilkes.
Thank you, Natalie, Jennifer, Julia, David, and Jamie, and Rip, of course. It's time to listen to some sorrows and concerns in our community. We don't have that many. Not many have chimed, but those who have, thank you for sharing with us. First comes from Rip Jackson, <laughs> who says he's um, joyful and grateful for a technology that works, and when it works. He's also sending deep love and support to Beth Walsh as she navigates her health journey. Mary Hissom asks us to hold the kids and adolescents' mental health in our hearts as they navigate the impacts of this pandemic, how it impacts their third year in school now. We must think about what they're gonna take with them going forward. We also have from Eric Svensson, joy that my son Peter will be starting his first professional job in a couple of weeks since graduating in December. Great note to end on. Thank you all who've sent those in. And we also want to give you a moment and also a shout out to those who maybe didn't send theirs in, but who feel maybe they're sending it to us in some other way. You help us make space, make meaning and purpose in our community. You remind us of the need for service and not just something that serves us. And that is what I think makes sacred community. Will you please join us in our final closing hymn, Be That Guide, <clears throat> number 124. closing words are a mashup, a good character mashup, coming to us from Heraclitus, 500 BC, a historian, and from Charles Spurgeon, a 19th century pastor. Let us go forward, determined just to be a little bit better to one another, understanding that the act of becoming a better character in this human narrative we are collectively creating is not accomplished in a week or a month but little by little, day by day, through protracted and patient effort. Let us know, let us know it as the best tombstone we could have. Those we loved and were helped by us will remember us when forget-me-nots have withered. Let us carve our names on hearts rather than marble and move through this world as a healing agent rather than a disease. Will you please stick around and enjoy the postlude? The postlude 
um, is defying gravity, and it will be sang to us by Natalie Briere. And it comes from the musical Wicked, and it was written by Stephen Schwartz. for joining us in our worship this morning. We now invite you to join us for social hour. We have a couple of options for you. Those of you who wish to socialize in a breakout room and the newcomers for the meet and greet breakout room need only to accept the invitation that, in, that Zoom will be sending you. You click the join breakout room button and then you will go to the correct breakout room. If you'd like to stay in the main room and speak with Reggie O'Hare Gibson, you just click later. Social hour will begin shortly. <laughs> 